welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sallenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey everyone, today's guest is Derek Scott. That is right, Derek Scott of the famous Derek Scott YouTube channel. That is him, and he and I talk like we forgot we were being recorded and that there would be lots and lots of people listening in on our conversation. Um, It gets pretty personal, and you will learn things about both of us that you didn't know, and maybe you didn't want or need to know. It's a little bit long. Um, Part of me wants to apologize for that, and then a part of me does not. I do want to apologize, though, because my Wi-Fi kept glitching. So imagine me walking to the cafe next door. I'm holding my laptop. I've got my headphones and I'm like walking through the snow trying to hurry up um, so I could use the Wi-Fi next door at this cute cafe. And there's no glitch issues. You won't know. I edited all that out, of course. Um, But there is some background noise. You can tell that I'm in a cafe for about, it lasts for about 10 minutes. Basically, there was like a loud customer that came in. Um, Otherwise, you can't tell. But there is going to be some noise and uh, this was bothering me as I was editing it. So I just wanted to speak for that. So Derek and I talk about so many things, but our main topic that's threaded through the whole episode is parenting. Um, We talk about our own exiles that come up as parents and how that affects our parenting. We talk a lot about shame. He gives some great information about power and how that affects repair and apologies. We also talk about the loss and grief that happens with parenting as our kids get older and as they grow up. At the end of the episode, we start talking about our own experiences with becoming parents, and I share a little bit of my own infertility journey, which um, I actually deleted until I realized that Derek brings up this whole um, really interesting story about whether a part is a part or a passenger. And I thought that's not going to make any sense without hearing the infertility stuff. So I went ahead and put that back in. It's really interesting and super fascinating about the passenger and part thing. So I thought you'd want to hear that. So I left that in. Derek gives an example of how he teaches IFS using psychodrama, which is super fun and really interesting. And that opens up a conversation about firefighters, which I thought was pretty cool. And then he talks through how he helps suicidal parts, which was super helpful and really inspiring. So I don't want to make this intro any longer than it needs to be. So thank you guys so much for listening. Um, head over to IFS Tammy on Instagram and the One Inside Facebook page. And if you want to hear more from Derek, um, head over to my friends at the IFS Talks podcast. I have had Derek on twice recently. So head over to IFS Talks. Their podcast is on iTunes and everywhere you can find podcasts. They've got lots of great guests and um, you can hear more from Derek over on their shows. But for now, listen with Derek and I as we chat about all the things. Take care. Enjoy. So I started IFS you know, getting really into it in 2014, I think. And I did Cape Cod, Cape Cod with Dick. Mm -hmm. And you were the only one doing anything online. Mm -hmm. Like I, you were the first person that I found. I watched every single one of your video on you videos (laughs) on YouTube because you were the only one. Mm 
Mm-hmm. There was nothing on Facebook. There was nothing on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to be like, you're a big deal and I'm a big deal too. But I also, I think I was one of the first people on Instagram because I'm like, IFS Tammy, there's nobody. <laughs> I'm hashtagging internal family systems. There's no one else hashtagging internal family systems. Well, let me, let me tell you, Tammy, I um, had a similar thing. I, I went to the retreat 15 years ago in Mexico, had my conversion experience. <laughs> Came home and went, oh my God, this is really, really important, like seriously important. So I, uh, I, so I Googled, okay, there's some organization. So I went onto YouTube, nothing, nothing. It's like, okay, do these, do these people not know that we're in the 21st century? Did, like, did they miss the memo, right? <laughs> this is how people look for information. So I, know. I, I thought it's important to get this information. It really is to get it out there because it's so cool. So I didn't have much money at the time. So I went to Best Buy got a video camera, made two really like um, crappy, but informative videos. And then I took the video camera back and got the money back because it was within two weeks, right? So. (laughs) (gasps) Oh my goodness. Parts of me are like horrified. Uh Mm -hmm. uh Yeah, I get that. Yeah, please take care of them. (laughs) (laughs) And there's another part of me that's like, man, I wish I could be more naughty. Uh-huh. I wish I was more naughty. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, some. Of, well, in all honesty and fairness, some of where my work has taken me is to the trickster. There's a trickster archetype. I think it's always been with me, but it's been misnamed as naughty, as a rule breaker, as not okay. And then a, a good few years ago, now I came across a book written by a Jungian analyst. It was brilliant. It was called Beyond the Hero, and he'd collected fairy tales and folk tales from around the world. So, a lot Eastern Europe, various other parts of Europe. And he pointed out that in the, the typical hero's journey for the male is, you know, the, the male goes to the patriarch and the patriarch sets him a test and the male goes off and passes the test and brings back the treasure and either gets the girl or gets to be the patriarch now. And that's been the, the pattern. That's the male pattern in the psyche around the patriarch. But he pointed out in every single one of these uh, folk tales, which is where information gets transmitted right, historically, there's another male figure often hiding under the bridge, you know, the troll under the bridge, often the guy that will give the misdirection to the hero, right? Not necessarily evil, not necessarily good, but a trickster, just like to play with all of it. And so this, this author was talking about that as a deeper male archetype, which I really like. I love the trickster archetype, so I play with that a lot. I love it. I love that. I love that idea, too, of that in parts language that you can embrace that part and let him come out and play and that other parts might have a, have a response to that. And that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, but they, but they don't override it. They don't get to override it. I like yeah. that. Yeah. My, my, my Puritan managers, I have to uh, attend to as well. <laughs> yes. Well, let's pause because you're in a t-shirt and I was wearing a wool hat a minute ago, mm. and so I know that you're not in Toronto because I'm guessing Toronto is really chilly. Yeah, I winter in Texas. I've got this really nice Airbnb uh, and the hill country outside of Austin. It's at the end of a 30-minute, it's a dirt road, and it's a nature reserve, so it's just gorgeous. And today it's 23 degrees. We're in, I'm in Celsius. That's probably mid-70s. So you, do you rent the Airbnb all winter? Yeah, three months, January through March. Wow. So is it your Airbnb or you rent it from no, someone I re- else? I rent, I rent it from someone else, but they really like me and they're dog people. So I packed the two dogs into the car in Canada at the end of December. Drive, it's a 25-hour drive. It's two days. But this place has dog doors. It has a fenced-in yard. And, it's, and they, the people really like me. So they've said, um, you know, you can have this for the next 10 years if you like for the winter. I'm like, I love it. That's wonderful. That's and great. You, do, you do so many things online. So do you yeah. do a lot of like therapy and consultation online so that you can do that yeah. from wherever you are? Yeah, I do pretty much. In the winter, I do, right? So there's an online um, course I run called Stepping Stone, which is um, it's actually a really good course. It's 16 weeks three hours a week, Um, but it's international. So I just started up again in January and I've got participants from Japan, from Singapore, from Spain, from the UK, from North America, from the West Coast. It's great. And so they all come together and then I I sort them out so that they have supervised practice triads online. 
right? So wow. I have, yeah, I have staff that will sit with them and help guide them through their practice triads and they have practice triads alone. Then we come back for a consult. So we find out what's going on in there as they're applying the model to their work. And then we come back and do more teaching and a, a demo. I do a demo every fourth time. What surprised me, I didn't know this would happen. Self energy just fills the screen. Right? You can feel it. It's so bizarre. All these people all over the world at the same time. Scheduling's a nightmare, but, but you can feel it. And the group begins to really uh, understand that. They begin to get this collective self energy. It's quite lovely. It's amazing. Yeah. How do people sign up? So it's happening right now, but how do people find out more about I'm like, I want to sign up for that. That sounds That's amazing. A, <laughs> it's good. It's on my, it's on my site. Uh, it's under courses. And I, I start it every January and every September. It runs for four months. Perfect. I mean, that's the the normal cycle of college and school is September, yeah. January. So perfect times to to do that. We're, we're already in the flow at those times. Like, right, yeah. even if you're not in school in September, I'm wanting to like buy notebooks and yeah. <laughs> and if you've got kids, they're back in school, which is yes, great. It's like yes. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was the first year. So my son's in third grade. This was the first year that I was like, oh, he's back in school. I'm going to have yes. some more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other years I was like, I'm losing him. It felt like such a loss. I know that. I know exactly that. How old is he? He's eight. Eight, eight mm-hmm. yeah. And what's his name? Aris. Aris. A-R-I-S. Oh, mm-hmm. that's great. He's going to be nine in a couple of weeks, and I can't even think about that. Like, I can't. To me, he's like three. Yeah. And I talk about him like he's three, and I snuggle with him like he's three. And, like, he can't be nine. Can't. I, I get what you're saying. But I also, I remember my daughter's 16 now, but when she was about nine, there were days when she was three. She'd just come in for that cuddly, snuggly three. And there were days when she was, like, you know, going on 14, Right. I'm, I'm going to go shopping in justice because it's cool. It's like, okay, love. <laughs> so it's almost like their, their parts, when they're aging, their parts cover a range of like four or five years around their chronological age, right? So that is really helpful. Forth. It's really helpful to hear that because I think you're right. Like there's times when he's, and he's really snuggly. He's an only child and we're super close. And so he's super snuggly. But there's definitely times when he's like, don't embarrass me. That's right. Yeah, so I'm not going to hold your hand today, but tomorrow, uh, I w- but tomorrow I will, right? Yeah, so yeah. one of the things with, it's it's actually a helpful way to understand the kids how they're moving from younger parts to older parts and learning parts because oftentimes parents will um, not get that and they'll say things like you know why can't you act your age or there'll be an expectation that if you felt all independent and strong yesterday for boys why aren't you today and mm. just help to notice well different parts are coming up at different time it's not a linear track right right so, right. Well, and I was thinking of, there's a part of me that feels some shame about this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyways. I think there's a part of me that's like, oh, you don't want to hold my, and thankfully I don't say this out loud. You don't want to hold my hand right now. Well, I'll remember that at eight o'clock tonight when you want to snuggle and I'm going to not let you snuggle with me. There's a part of me that's like, hurt me right now. I'm going to hurt you later. Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing, this is really important, Tammy. I'm so glad you named that despite the part saying there's some shame around it. Because here's the thing with those firefighters, right? You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. If you track that, if you track the part that was hurt, rejected, abandoned, devalued, whatever's going on for it, Mm. and you know this, I know you know this, you'll discover it's a much younger part in your own system. It actually has nothing to do with your boy, Mm. right? But that protector, and here's the thing that I really want people to hear, especially in terms of parenting, that protector, that I'm going to get you back, that part doesn't love your son. And it doesn't have to. That part loves your exile and wants to make sure it doesn't get hurt again. Okay. And that could be hard to hear. I know as a yes, parent. Yes, no, right? but I'm going to, I'm going to, that, yeah. but that, that is really, I can take that in that that part loves my exile, doesn't love my son. And it, that right. makes sense. Like knowing the model and absolutely. And it would, it would not just knowing the model intellectually, but that's what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily even know that it's your son that brought the trigger. All it knows is the exile is erupting. Find a way to, to, to change the state of the system. Don't be in the upset of the exile. Let's, stay, let's get into anger. Right? It's, it's easier to be in anger and blame. Right? Yes. So, so because of this, when people enter therapy, as I'm sure you know, therapy naive clients, you'll often hear this. Yeah, I've come to see you because I'm having trouble at work, but I had a great childhood. So, okay, I didn't even ask about <laughs> your childhood, but, but thanks anyway. So, but I think what's going on is we all have parts that feel that disconnect from our parents, 
mm-hmm. that feel the parents' firefighters when they're up, whether it's anger, whether it's alcohol, whether it's um, I don't have time, dismissiveness. Mm. And those protectors don't love the kid. And it's bewildering because it feels like, well, my, my mom and my dad don't love me. And that's where the exile comes in, right? And maybe it's because of something I did, and maybe it's my fault, and maybe I'm unlovable. And that's where we get the exile. So it's really important to normalize. Your firefighters, don't. their job is not to love other people. It's just mm. not, right? And so that if you can get that and take the responsibility for it without the shame, I get the shaming manager saying, you know, you shouldn't want to punish your boy, blah, blah, blah. Acknowledge that one. But it enables us to take responsibility. And, it's, and the responsibility can be like this. Honey, I'm sorry I overreacted. Mm. And that way, the responsibility for the disconnect, the disconnect from the love, from the self, the responsibility stays with the parent, which it should, because we're in a power dynamic here. Yeah. And the kid doesn't take on the burden. And on top of that, as I'm sure you know, kids are enormously forgiving. You say, oh, it's okay, mom. Right? Oh, uh, no. Just to say, this is my uh, current interest is on um, parenting and helping parents to really get this because we all come from a legacy of shame, right? Shame, shaming our kids, being shamed as a kid, very effective form of behavior control because you'll do anything to avoid it. It's so horrible, right? And it gets taken on. Or maybe I'm not a good kid. Maybe there's something wrong with me. And mm. as you know, if, if half of your clients, if they... Um, if their parents had ever apologized, they wouldn't be in therapy. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so true. Like if, if my mom, love her, but if my mom would have said, wow, honey, I'm so sorry for losing my temper, it would have softened me and that would have been it probably. I mean, but yeah, what a huge difference that would have made. That's right. Here's what makes that difficult because it sounds really straightforward. The apology, the taking responsibility, the I'm sorry If you've been raised in any sort of way that that's been connected to power or you should be ashamed or any of that, then it's going to be very difficult to come in with the apology. What makes it challenging to offer the apology is what you've learned about the apology. And your kid's eight, right? So do you remember when your kid was, I don't know, two, three, you're in the playground and either your kid or some other kid bites another kid because they just do that shit? Yeah. And then you see the parent like grab the kid by the arm, drag it over almost out of its socket, say, say you're sorry, say you're sorry, say you're sorry. There's no internal sense of regret. There's no internal sense of responsibility. All I did was bite him. I bite the dog. What's the problem? And so what the kid learns is power and essentially being bullied is associated with the words, I'm sorry. And so when parts have that association, it's very difficult to say the words, I'm sorry, if it's going to bring up all of that, right? Right, So we've got to be real real careful on on what we teach our kids about responsibility and then making repair, right? So sitting down and saying, you know, it doesn't feel good when someone bites you is is much more helpful, right? Yeah, yes. Well, and what about, right, I I often that gives me the worst feeling when it's like, go say you're sorry. And you're like, clearly you're not sorry. And so now I'm going to be made to say sorry. So then it's almost power. Yeah. 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 And powerlessness and nobody wants to go there. So you you do that to your kid enough times and it will learn. Oh, if I say sorry, it means I'm powerless. Instead of if I say sorry, I'm taking responsibility for having transgressed against you. Yeah. Right. So then as adults in our relationships, we don't then say sorry because I don't want to be powerless. That's right. And then we feel guilty, right? Because guilt is pro-social. Guilt is what I should feel if I've transgressed against you. That's why we feel it, right? right? But, and then it's an indicator that I need to make a repair with you. But if that repair is associated with powerlessness, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah. Well, and then, right, so then that shows up in our parenting because then I'm not going to say, well, I almost wonder, this, some, as a parent, we often feel powerless mm-hmm. and and don't, realize our own power and so I almost wonder if that's part of why you know sometimes when there's a situation that happens and I feel powerless in a situation let's say it's a play date or something and the the mom there's just the chaos or something and then I end up like snapping at my kid right because it's like I'm feeling all this angst or frustration or chaos and powerlessness and then I end up like being mean to him right Yeah, so then uh, however you do your own personal work, you need to unpack that so you can access the part of you that feels powerless because it'll predate, you know, today. 
And then the other piece is to, is to let your kid know, you know, I overreacted. Yeah. Because right? a firefighter is an overreaction, right? And you can name it as that. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm sorry. I, I over, and, and you don't let the kid off the hook for the behavior, right? You know, I'm sorry I overreacted. And let's see what was going on there because we don't want this to happen again. I don't like, you know, when, when uh, I get all mad. So let's see what's going on. One of the ways with my daughter that I, I really like to come into the repair you know, when I've done that, when I've snapped and I'm feeling justified because she should know better and all the stuff the partner wants to tell me. When, I, when that energy's calmed down a bit, I'm, I'm disconnected from her and I don't like it and I miss her. I love her. Mm. Right? So what I'll, what I'll do, um, if I can do it first, so then she does it first, but I'll come and sit next to her. So she's sitting mad at me, that's fine. And I'll sit next to her and I'll just say, I do not like being disconnected from you. Mm. And it just starts to soften again, and we can find our way back. Yeah. Because in any relationship, you've got rupture, and then you, you need to repair. Rupture and repair. You do that over time, and you get resiliency. The relationship knows it can handle mum going crazy, right? Or dad, <laughs> dad getting mad, right? The kid knows, okay, she'll be back at some point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's probably the best way to handle me. Like, mm. <laughs> she's going a little bit crazy, but she'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I love that, that it's like, I could just go and sit next to him and just say, I feel disconnected and that doesn't feel really good. And yeah. then that alone would just, just soften my parts yeah. too. Absolutely. Yeah. It takes a while to get back there. Cause if you're in high firefighter energy, you're in the your nervous systems hijacked and you're all justified and your kid's the worst kid in the world. And why did I have children? All of that. So once that's all calmed down, you'll notice you actually don't like the disconnect from your kid. You don't. You love yeah. your kid. Yeah. I'm going to back up and talk about this idea because this is probably like one of those like duh moments, but that idea that like if my kid refused to hold my hand and then that that trigger is an exile of mine that is, has nothing to do with him. That's right. And, and then it, it triggers an exile, which then triggers a firefighter that says, well, we'll show him, we'll be That's mean right. to him later when he wants something from me. Yeah. And then, but it's like this exile that's connected Right. So in, in the moment, I think I'm going to, I think I'm just thinking of what's happening right now, that right. he's being a jerk and all that stuff. Right. Instead of, okay, that's an exile that's connected to feeling abandoned or rejected yeah. or hurt or something like that, that that's yeah. my issue. Those are my, that's my work. Yeah. And yeah. I know you said that, but I was like, Okay, I just needed to kind of like highlight that. It bears repeating. And then, um, and then the other piece that I'm discovering with my daughter who's 16, your boy's eight, right? So from zero to whenever, I was dad. Dad was the best thing in the world, right? Time with dad was amazing. And when she was little, we'd go out with our butterfly nets for a walk by the river with the dogs. When she got older, we'd go and see Les Miserables or I'd surprise her with tickets to Wicked and... Now she's 16 and she has, she's had a partner for a year. And that age appropriately and developmentally is where she goes for sucker, is where she goes to be understood, is where she goes for comfort. And there are parts of me that deeply miss having a little girl. And it's really important to grieve, to acknowledge those life transitions and to grieve them because otherwise we'll try and force our kids into being who they're not, especially as teenagers. So, you know, if you've got an eight-year-old, enjoy. Enjoy these years, crazy as they can be, because at some point, mom will be annoying. That'll be the main characteristic of mom, right? And you'll miss, you'll so miss him. You'll so miss those snuggles. And oh. it's import, important to miss them and grieve them. This is how we move through attachment and loss and attachment and loss in a healthy way. Mm. I can't even hear that. <laughs> so you don't have to right now. <laughs> You you can't face uh, nine at the moment, <laughs> let alone sixteen. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, how do we survive it? Like, how does it not break us? We att it doesn't break us because we attach to the parts of us that hold. I call them the lost cluster, right? So there are parts in every human being, in my experience, because it's a universal experience that respond with sadness, that respond with protest. I don't like this. I hate this. It's not fair. 
that respond with regret. Oh, I wish I'd have paid more time, spent more time in loving ways with my kid. Why did I have to be such an asshole? Um, <laughs> and, and, and longing, longing to have that back, right? So because that group of parts is willing to do all that work and hold all of that space, uh, of course, they'll tend to blend, right? But when they get our attention, we can come to them and say, hey, what do you need me to know? Right? And around any significant loss, I really miss you know, the little girl that would say, daddy, what are we going to do today? Right? I really miss that. And I can say to that part, I hear you. And that may trigger a part that feels so sad around all that. And I can hear that one too. And then a, a young one that wants to say, it's not fair, because he responds to any loss with it's not fair. And I can gather him up as well. So instead of those parts blending with their emotional intensity, I can hold them in their emotional intensity. And these are not parts that are burdened. These are just parts that do this. This is their job. So we can love them and thank them. They're like little bodhisattvas doing this. Mm -hmm. That's how we get through it. Now, if there's a part... The, many of us have not been well supported in losses in our own childhood, so it may take us back to, you know, what did you learn when your pet died or when you moved schools or when you changed classes or, you know, mm. how was that? How disruptive was it and what came up for you and how were you supported? And if you weren't supported or if you had parents saying, you don't be silly or it's a good thing, uh, then, yeah. then you'll have your internal minimizers saying, we don't need to go there. Grief doesn't matter. You just keep moving forward, blah, blah, blah. So you want to explore, you know, what, what may be parts holding burdens around loss or strategies around loss so that you can be open to the parts that hold the feelings around it so you don't drown in them and you don't spend all your time trying to avoid them. That is so beautiful. So what I'm hearing is two really awesome things. One is that with self, I'm not going to be broken and I'm not going to be lost in my brokenness because of self and thank God for that. Yeah. And that self being with all those parts and all those feelings and that just feels really good even as you were talking about it. Mm. And then the other thing is, and I already noticed this as you were talking before you were talking is that the parts of me that have come up with strategies to deal with loss. Uh, Frank Anderson did a training on parenting at a conference a couple years ago. And one of the things that he said about parenting was something about we parent like the before story of our parenting uh, the pre-story has something to do with how we parent. And I have a significant pre-story around fertility and loss. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that helps me get through that is if I can't have a baby, I'm just going to go build wells in Africa yeah. because – First of all, I would never go build wells in Africa, so I thought uh -huh. it was kind of funny um, and ridiculous. And But it also gave me a sense of like, okay, well, if it's not going to happen, then I have to do something different. Yeah. I can't just live regular life with all these people getting pregnant around me. Like, that, I can't tolerate right. that. So I'm going to go build wells in Africa. And it really helped – It that really helped me during, you know, sort of this 10-year craziness. And so – when you talked about your 16 year old and, and then I was starting to think about like when my son, you know, has a girlfriend or whatever. And I started thinking, so this part came up that was like, well, that's when you'll like write the great American novel, or that's when you'll travel the world or like sort of giving me these other ideas of like, okay, we're going to find the positive and we're going to go do something. And I didn't even realize that was happening until I'm like, oh, wait, that's my strategy for loss. Yeah, yeah. I even have a strategy for like, if he was to die, then, mm -hmm. okay, well, I'll just go live in my mom's basement. And that's what I'll do. Yeah, yeah be a shut-in. Yeah. yeah. That Great sounds strategy. good to me. Yeah. 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 So brilliant. So these, these powers that have these strategies, they're amazing, right? They're amazing. You can thank them. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, you know, there's, there's a nugget of, of truth here as well. People think about grief as just, you know, those things I named, sadness, protest, regret, missing, longing. You cannot stay in those parts all the time because you wouldn't thrive, you wouldn't function. So there's an oscillation between those parts and the parts that we call the restoration cluster, the ones that are moving forward, the ones that say, okay, what's lost and process that, and then what's left, and then what's possible. Mm. Right. So, um, with the restoration cluster, and this comes up for people, um, just as yours did, it comes up naturally and organically. You move from one group of parts to another group of parts. So, if you have, for example, parental death, 
and it was a good relationship by and large, then you're going to have a lot of parents, of course, grieving parental death. Some of them will be kids. Some of them will be from different ages of your life. Uh, you'll also have parents grieving if it's, your, uh, if, you've only, if it's your last parent to die, then you're suddenly an orphan in the world and nobody exists on the planet to call you uh, my girl anymore or whatever. So there's, there's the, the shift in, in your sense of identity in the world. But at the same time, as all that's being attended to, you may hear a voice saying, oh, Oh, mum died. I wonder how much we'll get and if we can pay off the mortgage. <laughs> right? And that's the part, that part is not grieving. It's not part of the grief cluster. It's part of the restoration yeah. cluster. It's moving forward. And what tends to happen if people don't get that is the part will come in and say, oh, you're such a terrible person. You have this manager come in, right? You're meant to be grieving. How could you think about money when mum just died? And this, this is the gift of multiplicity because different uh, yes. parts do different things, yes, right? Yes, yes. I love thinking of it as clusters. I, I like that. I've never thought about it. I always call them gangs. There's this really, this part of me that thinks she's very funny and she likes to say, and I'll, so, so I'll say that with patience. I'm like, all right, well, so, you know, we're kind of identifying this one and there's sort of probably like a gang of parts. Right, right, right. Because you know, I live in New Hampshire and we're full of gangs up here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you've obviously got much more street than I do. So. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> that is exactly right. I saw it when you were snapping before we started. It was so clear. Yes. <laughs> but I like that. And, and, and again, you're right. It's like, it's why multiplicity makes so much sense. This part of me would, uh, you know, and especially connected to, to little parts that are feeling this heaviness of this loss. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and then another part is like, feels relief, especially if there's been illness. And, yes. um, and then, yes. you know, another part, in that same cluster would be like, how much money can he get? And yeah, yep. I think that makes yep. a ton of sense to understand them as clusters. It totally does. Yeah. 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 Where's your daughter now? Does she come to Texas with you or is she up uh, in Toronto? <laughs> where, where is she? Well, funny you should ask. She lives, she lives in Toronto with her mother most of the time. And the uh, previous years I've been down here, I've flown her down for March break or we've gone to Costa Rica and we've actually met in Costa Rica for a week. Fun. And, but this year, she has a boyfriend, and she wants to spend March break with her boyfriend. Of course she does. So I had, actually had a good chat with her around Christmas time, and I said, love, I'm moving more into the background now of your life, which is how it is, and it's how it's meant to be. And I want you to know I will always be in the background for your life. And she could hear that, and that made sense. I know she's in her first relationship. I know when it crashes and burns, she's going to go through an awful, awful, awful time. There's nothing. If you remember first love, you know that despite what everybody else has ever said, they didn't have this love. This is the love. Right? (laughs) This is different. This is different. This is. And it feels like it's first love, and nobody could possibly ever understand these feelings. And then when it ends, the devastation, right? So yeah. that'll be in the background. That might come into the foreground a bit more for a while. And then she'll find her way to her next relationship. I'll be in the background again. It just seems to be how it is for adult parenting. You know? It actually, as a child, like as a, as a kid, thinking of my father, there is, when you said that about being in the background, there's sort of two parts of me. It felt this like pang of loss and, oh, like, oh, Mm-hmm. Oh, that's all I could describe. But then there's another part that was like the idea that my dad is in the, even now he lives in Maryland, but even now ha- is in the background of my life. It gives me comfort. Like that mm-hmm. idea that he's still there. And yeah. I, and I think I'm probably closer to my dad now. My parents were divorced and I only saw my dad on the weekends and a couple of years. I maybe only even only saw him like once or twice a year. Um, I'm much closer to him now you know, I see him. Anyways, I'm much closer to him. We text. It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, but just that idea of the comfort, the comfort and the security that my dad is like right there. Yeah. It feels really good. Yeah. 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 I didn't think I was going to be crying so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a part. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I definitely accept my crying parts way more than I did before. Yeah. Good. Yeah. They, they like that. They like that. And the poor, poor parts. Of course, they want to be, you know, nurtured if they're crying. They're also there. There's something about the the grieving parts. The the fact they're willing to do this. The fact they're willing to hold all of this sadness for me, so that I can th- go on with my life and attend them periodically. I'm so grateful to them. Mm. Right, because it's, you know, I think as a therapist, we have. Well, I'll speak for myself. I have fantastic containment parts. 
like so that I can hear these horrible things mm. and be with this person and then have a five minute break when you're doing notes and going to potty and then go back yeah. and you know go to the next yeah. person and tune to them. And I think it's probably connected, you know, I'm really good at that and it's probably connected to how parts of me handled growing up. And yeah. even like um like one of the benefits of having divorced parents is I can feel at home anywhere because I just had to get used to this transition and there's, there's some benefits to that. And I mm -hmm. think that idea of like containment, but sometimes I think what's happened is then it becomes almost too contained. And then I don't, I don't, I don't attend to those parts that, that need, and this actually happened this week where I heard something um, that was devastating and it like yeah. stuck with me. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like even yeah. after the end of the day, I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. Yeah. And then I had a firefighter that came in and ate all the sugar and mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, what's happening? Something's happening. Yeah. So, and so then I had so, to be with that part. I absolutely. couldn't just, what's the word we use in IFS? It looks like you're pushing it away with your Yeah, hand. pushing it away. <laughs> 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 I want to say hijack. That's not the right word. Um, reject. You know, reject. Yeah. So, um, so I just want to respond to that because there's two pieces here. I think one is uh, one of the gifts of the model as therapist is if a part of you gets triggered by some, by a client's, what's going on in the client's life, you can attend to that. So particularly with loss, I lost my beloved dog, George, a year and a half ago. He was amazing, like a dog from a movie, just amazing, 11 years companion for me. And it was really hard. And then if a client's presenting with grief, of course, it triggers my parts that, A, I want to start talking to the client about my dog, which is not going to happen. <laughs> um, right. But B, and not allowing me to hear the client. So because I can say to those parts, hey, I know you're thinking about George. I'm going to spend time with you after the session, okay? Because mm -hmm. they're not in time and space. They're just in, in the body, right? They're in their own right. dimension. But then they'll say, okay, and they'll pull back so I can stay with the client. So it's really important to have a sense of your own uh, capacity to grieve and your own grieving parts so that they don't hijack or your protectors don't shut the client down because you're being triggered. Right. That's one right. piece. But the second piece is in our line of work, there's something about the awful things we hear. And there's the tragedy of being human sometimes, which, which affects us, I think, at the level of our humanity. It's not about triggering a specific part, right? Mm. So I want to check in and just see if you want to talk more about your parenting, the videos you're thinking of doing, or is there anything sure. about that you want to talk about? Yeah, well, it's it's not quite ready, but I've got um, a whole bunch of videos. This has been a long-term project. I've got a whole bunch of videos and a whole bunch of contributors. So I think I've got 13 IFS therapists who have contributed to this. That's awesome. Yeah, and I've got an IFS level one grad. His name is Liam, really super guy, and he's um, helping um, edit them all uh, because it's so much work. And uh, what it's going to be, all of the videos I, I offer are free, so I've got 40 on my YouTube channel, as you know. Um, so there's going to be a parenting tab on my site, and all of these videos are going to be available for new parents, parents that have been around for a long time, parents of adult kids, what I really, really want, Tammy, is people to get some of the dynamics we've been talking about. So here's the thing. You've got parts. Your parents had parts. Uh, you have parts in reaction to your parents' parts. Your kid has parts. <laughs> How can you hold that unfolding of your kid's parts, right? Because some of your kid's parts you're not going to like, and those are parts of you that don't like those parts. So you, you, mm. that's just fine. But if you can get clarity on it. Yeah. And, and in my childhood, I was raised, as most of my generation was, with shaming. So, of course, when, I, when my kid shows up, I've got parts that want to say things like, um, uh, why would you do that? What's wrong with you? What would you have to do that for? What were you thinking? I don't even think that you think. That was my, <laughs> that was my mother. That, is that a really good... Um... What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Is channeling? That a, yeah. Are you channeling her voice really well? <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's, that's how I hear it in my head, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Love um, it. So, so, that, so that part would come up, right? Oh, my kid's done something. I need, I need to. What were you thinking? Are you stupid? Right? So I hear the part and it's like, I appreciate how you're trying to help. Mm. I've, I've got this. We're going to do this a little differently. Right? Mm. But I can only do that, Tammy, because I've worked with the parts that were on the receiving end of the shame. And I've worked with the parts that made all that okay so they could pull back because it's not okay. Yeah. It's not okay. To shame your kid, to shame anyone right. is not okay. Right? right. 
there's an exercise I do as part of the courses I teach around shame. And um, I ask people, what messages did you get ever about being too much or not enough? Because they're both shaming messages, right? And the list, it's amazing when you do it, the list, it's all a list of human qualities. If you just take away the two, if you take away the judgment, you've just got a list of qualities. Wow. Too independent, too strong, too sensitive, too, you know, keep going with the list. Take away all the twos and you have people in the room who are sensitive, who are strong, who are independent. And those parts have been judged mm. and shamed, right? So it's, it's mm. more difficult for them to manifest. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, then what happens if those are like natural, natural abilities or natural gifts and then we're told that we're too whatever that is, then we exile, that's the word I was looking for, ironically, yeah, yeah. I couldn't find it. Um, yeah. Then we exile those parts, those like natural, really amazing things about us yeah. that then aren't gifts for us or for the world. That's right, we can't shine, we can't manifest, and we operate at a limited capacity. You know, there was a woman I was working with, one of my clients, I just loved her, she was a hairdresser by trade and uh, fun and bubbly and smart and really, really great, great person to work with. And she was a uh, single child and she was told when she was little that she was bossy, right? When just, so there was a part of her when she's five, she's being bossy. She has to stop bossing the other children around. So she connected with the bossy part um, and what it was doing was it was organizing the kids in this game because it knew how to make it work and nobody else was stepping forward. So, and she knew this was going to be a good thing. So I said, well, this bossy part, does it, does it like being called bossy? She said, no, it likes being called the leader. I'm like, well, let's go with that. So she had this early leadership coming forward. Yeah, right. That got, got squashed, right? Once she got clarity on it and once it was able to unburden the, oh, I'm too bossy, there's something wrong with me. And it was able to step into, actually, I, I'm a good leader. Shortly thereafter, she left the salon she was working on where she was making, I didn't know this about salon, she was making half of the money that she was charging her clients because half goes to the rental of the chair. She now has her own salon. And, wow. she's, and she's loving it, right? And she's a total leader. She's, she's making all the decisions. Yeah, so this is one of the key pieces around... If we don't like parts of our kid, there's, we've got some work to do about that, whether it's grieving or whether it's triggering you know, parts in our own history. Dick talks about, the Dick Schwartz talks about our children's exiles are not our exiles. So he had a shy part growing up. And when his, one of his daughters presented with shyness, he you know, tried to you know, get her to not be shy. He basically exiled her shyness. It wasn't okay because in his childhood, shyness wasn't okay, but in hers, it actually is different world, different context, right? So, right. Well, yeah. that makes sense, right? That I'm going to treat my kids' parts the way I treat those parts in myself, right? So if he's being too sensitive, which he's a sensitive little guy, right. then the parts of me that don't like my sensitive parts right. that like join with my mom and my dad and everyone else in my life who told me I was too sensitive, right. then will then sometimes shame him for being too sensitive or get annoyed with him. I don't think I should, it probably does, but it's sort of this annoyance of like, oh my gosh, here we go again. Like whatever yeah, we're yeah, doing yeah. is going to be harder because yeah. he's too sensitive. I'm doing air so, quotes. <laughs> I did I air quotes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want so, the listeners um, to know I did air quotes. So I, it's my belief, it's my understanding. And I see this again and again and again. Self energy, if you like, or, or manifesting on manifesting who we are. Right? Maybe, that, yeah. maybe this is a soul's journey that we're on and maybe our souls need to manifest and our souls are the most tender, sensitive beings. Right? And I think of children as, I think of them as solar nodes, right? They're, they're actually navigating the world in a way that they want to manifest and the gifts that they can bring, the gifts that we all bring when we're able to manifest who we are, the, the, the differences um, contribute to the salad of humanity, right? This, my retreat center is called Namaskar. Namaskar is old Sanskrit. It means I bow to or I honor the form you have taken. So namaste is I honor, I acknowledge the light within you. Of course, we all have the light within you. Namaskar honors the form you have taken. What richness do you contribute to humanity that's different from how I contribute? Wow. And if, and if our children could be welcomed into that understanding, and if they can then parent from that place, what we have here is an evolutionary model not just a psychotherapeutic. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I love that. So what I was thinking of as a parent and what I hear 
um, I don't know that I hear this in myself yet, but I hear it with, I see a lot of teenagers Mm -hmm. and I hear it in their parents is I need, as my parent, my job is to mold the form because they're about like, so if I see teenage, a lot of teenage girls. And so they're about to be, you know, go to college. And so I need to mold them. I need to mold the form so they can be productive, kind people. And so this sort of this panic on parents' parts to mold the kid. The yeah, form. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that molding, you can hear it. Uh, it's managerial, right? You, you, it's using words like productive. Right? Well, that's, uh, yeah, well, that's right. part of, that's the legacy of the culture. It's important to notice because what if my kid isn't productive? Right? Yeah. In a productive managerial way. What if my kid needs to spend three years hitchhiking around the world and then uh, doing art? Is that unproductive? You know, is that not going to university and all the things that my parts would value? Mm. And how do I respect those decisions? I do not know her journey. I don't know where her life is taking her. It's a mystery. It's part of the, the, the magical mystery of our lives. Or how do they unfold? And I don't want to inhibit that process. I do want to provide a container that's about safety as much as possible. So yeah. there's some really practical decisions like she's 16. Can she sleep unsupervised with her boyfriend? No. Right. 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 And some, some parents may say, yes, that's fine. My system says no. Right. right? Because it doesn't want to, um, they may well be sleeping together. That's absolutely fine. But I don't want to create an environment in which she may inadvertently feel pressured or there won't be the break of, oh, well, what if my dad hears this, right? She might need that out. And so I wanted to have that out. Right. So, yeah. um, but those are, those are tricky decisions to make. How do I hold and respect her as a, an independent blossoming 16 year old with a, long-term partner now a year it's a long time at that age and how do I also hold my parental responsibility so I don't facilitate environments where she may be at risk yeah I love how you're thinking through that and that there isn't right there's a there's a there's a different answer for everyone and but the way you're thinking through that doesn't feel anxious or puritan it feels very thought through and it feels very calm yeah and I think sometimes as parents we have to make these decisions and it's like I don't know yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do. At one point in my life, I, I worked in AIDS work for many years, which is where I got the, a lot of the expertise around grief. But I was at one point working in public health, and there was a very middle class high school in Toronto that we wanted to bring. Um, I was an AIDS educator, so we wanted to start teaching the kids about safer sex, right? From grade seven up. And there was a lot of parents that were upset about this. So we had a parents' evening. So they, they could meet me, they could understand the programs, they could understand the importance of it all. And a lot of them were sitting there, arms folded, like, who is this guy? What's he going to be telling our kids? I think I was late 20s at the time, too. And so they were, they were not having it. They were not on board, right, with any of what I was saying until it occurred to me to say, I said, I want you all to stop for a moment and just reflect back on your first ever sexual experience with another person. I'm not going to ask you about it, but I want you to reflect back on it. And if it was, shall we say, less than stellar, (laughs) maybe a bit of information might have helped you, or maybe an understanding of refusal skills might have helped you. Mm -hmm. And then you could just, I mean, (laughs) apparently the entire group looked fucking horrified because you can see them going back to early experiences that were not good, that they didn't get to tell anybody about, that they had to somehow navigate. Right. And so um, then they got on board. That's great. Yeah, that would fun. have been so scary to be in front of all those people with those closed arms and stuff. Uh, I don't know. Actually, I don't. I've got really good group facilitator parts. So when I look at them, it's like, okay, I, I, I don't get scared. I go to, how can I get in? I know I can find my way in. Oh, okay. I, just, I like what, it. What, what are they showing me and what's threatening to them and how can I get in? Right. It's like a little, um, like, I'm going to win. Like, hmm. There's that trickster again, right? I did that. It's a trickster. I like it. I like it. I always ask this of people, and I'm curious for of you, is what would you be doing differently if you weren't doing all the amazing gifts that you're giving us? Like, you're giving us so many amazing things, Derek. I hope you know that. Well, thanks. I, I can just speak for myself that I'm so grateful for everything that you're putting out there and that you've put out there for the past couple of years. Just mm. so grateful. If you weren't doing that, what would you be doing? It's an easy question to answer because it actually goes back to um, when I was in, in AIDS work. So what happened in my community was AIDS hit mid-80s and uh, devastated us. About 
in downtown Toronto, about a quarter of the men were infected at the time. It looked like we had two years uh, before death. And so whatever career path I was on, I um, switched and started focusing on the crisis. Wow. But if I had not done that, my two loves are actually uh, children and musical theater. Imagine that, right? Gay man who likes children and musical theaters. So I would have been, I think, um, teaching drama to kids or helping them create musicals or something like that. It's a real love that I have. And it's a path not taken. Mm. Um, but I had some parts have some regret around, not so much now, uh, but I've had to attend to that, that path not taken and the regret. Uh, but yeah. what I do now uh, fires me with passion. It feels important. I've got really creative parts. I don't know if you've seen them, Tammy, but, but I've got my latest video series is on shame. And, and again, it's free, but there's a guided meditation that um, people can access their own parts holding shame and, and begin to release them. So that's been... Um, very well received. Um, so, uh, so that's that was what. And then the next project is the parenting one. And then I've also at my retreat center, I've got a weekend on grief in May. I go to Australia in August. They've asked me to do the the weekend on grief uh, and transitions in Australia. So that's exciting. I'm going to back you way up because in one of the earlier videos, so you went from getting this camera from Best Buy and returning it, <laughs> but now you've got amazing lights. I mean, I'm sitting here in a cafe, there's a weird cat picture behind me. Yeah. Like you have this, I mean, do you have a studio that you have now? Because you've got crazy lights and you've done a video where you are, the video is the camera's on you as the therapist and then on you as the patient or client right. like so you've done amazing things and I have a little history with video production one of my past not taken is after high school I always thought it was too stupid for college mm -hmm. and so I was the anchor on my TV I don't think I've ever I've told this on the podcast yet but I was the anchor on my TV my high school TV news and so um, this broadcasting institute in Baltimore came to our school and I was like maybe I'll do that so I went to this broadcasting institute and I wanted to work in television that's that's what I wanted to do mm. and I ended up at a community college right outside of DC and I ran their like speech it's like when you go to um, you take a speech class and they videotape you so you could learn and so I ran a speech lab and I videotaped the theater and it was really fun a great experience but they had like one of those like um, scales. So like if you took classes, you could get more money. So I started taking classes just because like, well, I could get more money and I'm like 21 or something. And I took a psychology class and was like, mm. what is this? I love this. Mm. Um, why am I telling you this long story? Oh, just because I, I've been impressed with your video, with what's happening. And it's so, this was 20 years ago. So I'm sure. completely out of what, what's happening in video these days, but I've been impressed. And I have this well, what, background, yeah. so I feel like I feel like I'm like, wow, what this guy's doing is amazing. Well, what I did was, you know, so that was my first attempt, right? And then uh, <laughs> I got I got I got better at it, right? So uh, that video where I'm client and therapist, I had to. It was so much fun. I had to script it all out. Um, I'm running around my house with a step ladder and with the script taped on the step ladder, with the video oh, camera sitting gosh. on the step. I've got big lights shining on it. When I was playing the therapist, I had a full long beard. When I was playing the client, I shaved it off. It was so fun. And, uh, and then I had to cut and paste it all. So that was, I got better at it, basically. And then I started hiring a videographer. So um, the videos that I make, they, they are gifts. They are, there's no charge for them, right? But I also want them to be good. I want them to be good quality. So uh, my friend Joanna, her partner, Michael, is a videographer. So he helped make the, I don't know if you've seen the IFS for Therapist series, it's 10 videos. He helped make that. And the production, as you say, is amazing, right? There's a, a musical intro, there's lighting, there's, and he's so good. I've never worked with a videographer before, so he would look at the shot and he'd say, mm, yeah, that wood behind has a little bit of uh, shine to it. I'm going to put an amber filter on my light. I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, like six hours to set up a room. Oh. Uh, yeah. And then the results are amazing. So, um, so that that's part of the shift in the quality is I've been able to hire somebody. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking about that. You're like it's not musical theater, but it is theater, and so it's like the parts of you that 
had to like let that path go. It's like it sort of showed up in a different way That's right. in something That's right. you wouldn't have ima- it wouldn't have imagined. Yeah. And when I'm teaching, I, I have performer parts that love to come out and teach, right? So they get to play. Because you're like, on a stage. Totally, right? And they get yeah. to play where they get to play in a way that's really honest and really helpful. And mm. there's this way I have a teaching the model. I'll just share it with you. It's so cool. Um, I'll ask somebody to represent uh, a part that holds maybe body shame, right? So they'll stand up. And then um, there's a part saying, don't tell all your secrets. It's funny. <laughs> and then uh, I'll say, okay, here's the scenario, right? I'm a friend of yours. Hi, uh, Tammy. Uh, yeah, listen, we finally got the pool ready. It's going to be ready in two months. Uh, the party's on Saturday, the first of the month, and uh, it's um, bikinis and speedos. I'll see you there. Hang up. And then I ask the group, because usually people will go, <gasps> so I'll say, what just came up for you, right? And someone will say, I'm not fucking going. So, okay, <laughs> come up here and stand next to the part holding the shame, right? Somebody else, how much weight can I lose in two months? Come up and stand next to the shame. Somebody else, um, maybe if I, get, if I go in a moomoo, I can get away with it. So there you've got it. Three managers, different strategies, but really clearly proactive around the exile, right? Yeah. Zap it forward. You're now at the pool party, you're at the buffet, and someone standing next to you says, oh, you're so brave, I couldn't even look at that cheesecake. Then what comes up? And then someone will say, fuck you, okay, come up, right? What else? Because I'm just, I've got to eat two pieces of cheesecake in front of you, okay, come up. So now we've got the firefighters, and it's it's so obvious, because the model is accurate. It's just so obvious, but it's lively, it's engaging, it's fun. And there you've got three managers, three firefighters, all connected to an exile. And then I'll say to the managers, so um, you, the one that wanted to bring the moo-moo, how do you feel towards that one that just told the party guests to fuck off? Oh, my God, you know, they're going to hate us. They're going to talk about us. We're going to lose all our friends. So you manage a firefighter polarity. You just keep asking. And it's right there. It's visually right. Yeah. It's theater right there. Yeah. It's wow. theater, it's psychodrama, and it's clear. It's yes. really, really clear. Everyone yeah. knows this. Yeah. And then you've got by, and then I can start doing the didactic teaching. Okay, so we call these managers, you know, you bring self to them, blah, blah, blah. But that piece, people just get it. Wow. Yeah. I love that. As you were talking, I was remembering a time when I worked at a... <laughs> I worked at a bank. (laughs) I worked at a bank and I was probably 30 pounds heavier than I am now. I don't just part of me that needs you to know. I was bigger than I am now. And I remember eating at this Mexican, like we all went out for someone's birthday and we were eating this Mexican restaurant and I was eating this delicious like burrito with like white sauce and seafood. And I had two people, different people at different times that didn't hear each other say something to me about wow, like you're going to eat that or wow, I wish I could eat that or (laughs) something like that. (sighs) (sighs) Right. Right. So that part just came up to say hello. So say hello. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the other thing too that's interesting about that psychodrama that you did is to hear that other people's to hear that idea that other people's parts that say like F you, the parts of me that are like, I didn't even know that was an option. Like, I didn't right. even know I could be like, you're an asshole. Like, right. I didn't even know that was an option. I thought the only option is for me to feel horrible shame and then to look down, no eye contact and eat all this and then eat stuff off other people's plates and then go home and eat tons more. Like to my parts, that's the only option. Right. So that's your, that's your lead firefighter, right? And what it does yes. is, yeah. like all firefighter activity, it changes the state of the system. Instead of being in the shame, you've got like lovely sugary sweet stuff going in. And that feels better than the shame, right? And yeah. Just, so that's, that's one of your fire. That's your lead firefighter. Somebody yes, else would lead with fuck, with fuck you. <laughs> I need a little bit more of that. Yeah. Somebody else would go smoke a joint, right? Mm. Or somebody else would go, tragically to me, teenagers, right, more common than anyone else, teenage girl may go and just cut in the bathroom after that event. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. 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 I do love my cutter teenagers, though. That's probably my favorite. Mm-hmm. It's my it's favorite great. population. It's great. T- tell me why, because it scares a lot of people, right? No, I, I think I love those big feelings. Yeah. And it makes sense. It makes so much sense to me. Yeah. Like you are, you have so many big feelings and nobody gets it and you feel all alone and this helps. And I get that it helps. And I just, 
yeah, I just get it. It makes so much sense yeah. to me. I'm the same with suicidality. Mm. I, mean, I, I actually really, this might sound odd, process, this sounds strange, um, but no, because there's someone, you know, it's, it's, the big, it's the big thing, right? Yeah. I want to kill myself. I say, okay, so can I speak to the suicidal part? Yeah, okay, so here's my guess. You're aware that there is so much pain in the system um, and you want it to end, right? Right, okay. And also, this person's tried everything. They've tried all the different kinds of therapy. They went to the ayahuasca retreat. They went on a site of meditation retreat. Nothing helped, right? Right, okay. So that makes sense to me. If nothing's helped, if life is only about pain and trying to avoid it, why would you want to live that way? Is that right? Yeah, great. I get that. I totally get that. Now listen, if we could shift the relationship to the pain in any way, would you be willing to allow us to do it? And invariably, the suicidal part will say, I don't believe you can do that because yeah. otherwise, it, you know, it's, it, would, it would go for another option. And I'll say, I, I'm not asking you to buy in. I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm asking you to give me three sessions. Can you pull back for three sessions? Mm-hmm. And suicidal parts, actually, if there was some other way, they don't want to kill the system. And so they will pull back for three sessions. And then by the time three sessions have gone by, there is a different relationship to the pain. Self's available to it, whether or not it's been unburdened. Self is now available to it. Self is clear that there are parts holding the pain, but they don't need to define the system. And in my experience, Tammy, the suicidal part doesn't show up again. Wow. It honors wow. the contract, right? Wow. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's what's so beautiful is that when we, when we get self on board, even if we haven't done a full boarding, like even from my own self, as soon as my protectors feel self and, and there's a little bit of that befriending, I feel a huge difference in my whole system. Sure. Just with self being there, just with a yeah. little bit of unblending, a yeah. little bit of unblending feels so much different. Yeah. And then with your teenagers, you can help them come to those big feelings, right? Ask them not to overwhelm you because it makes yeah. it hard to stay, but yeah. let them know you get that they're big. And then, and yeah. then the cut, the cutters can relax. Right? right. The cutting part, right. The part that says this is, this is what, just like my, my eating part, right. It's, it's the best idea to help. Right. So the cutting yeah. part that, that, and just suicidality too, is like, here's how I'm going to help you. We'll just, we'll just kill ourselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, the, it's the only idea they have and it's trying to help. And to date, that's been the the only option they've known. Yeah, which is which is why, as you know, when self comes online, often parts will say, "Where have you been? And yeah. why are you showing up now?" Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely had that. Like, where have you been? I had that a lot. So, what do you do for fun when you're down there in in Texas, <laughs> in seventy Texas. degrees? And I you're watch- outside of Austin, which is amazing. I've heard that's like such an amazing community down there. Well, you know, I hate to disappoint your your parts, but uh, I'm a, I'm actually deeply introverted. So, um, what I do for fun is I walk the dogs in the woods, and sometimes I'll take Barbara with me in my headphones. Um, but I live at the end of a thirty minute dirt road, and there's no one here, and I love it. All right, so let me get you said that. It, does it take you thirty minutes to drive down that road? Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other houses on that road? No, there's a, well, a couple and there's a golf course, but it's Texas, right? So one of the houses has crossed guns and it says, uh, we, uh, we live with the second amendment. But no, I'm you get about- lonely? No. No. No, I have a lonely part that comes up sometimes. And so I just sit with it and I get some popcorn and we watch TV together and we're good, right? And I think this is the thing about knowing you have parts and being single. I choose to be single. Um, and there are parts of me that don't always like that choice, right? Parts mm-hmm. that are lonely, parts that have fantasies about, you know, if I had a partner, maybe I could just rub my neck and say, how are you doing? And I hear all those parts, right? But all of the other stuff you have to go through with a partner. So, so by and large, I like, I, by and large, my system likes being single and we can take care of our lonely parts. And the other thing about, um, seeking partners is, as you know, it's often those uh, burdened young parts that seek redemption. So they're seeking redemption from a partner that has a similar energy to the the parent that rejected them, right? Well, once you clear those, then the the way we come into partnership is entirely different. It's not being led by children that feel badly about themselves. Right, Right. and need that redemption. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not close to a partner, but my question would be, what do you have to offer? That's going to en- enhance, good- enhance my life, you know, because yeah. it's, pretty, it's pretty good right now. You know? When's the last time you had a partner? Oh, 28 years ago, I think. Were you married to your daughter's mom? No, she's a lesbian, and okay. uh, she asked me if I would co-parent with her. 
Okay. So um, no, I was I was blessed. I was um, I hit forty. I'd always wanted to be, always wanted to be a dad. And one of my griefs when I came out at fourteen to myself was that I wouldn't be a dad. So I believed. Yeah. And then as times changed, I thought, well, um, if I have a long term partner, we could maybe adopt. But the long term partner didn't appear, and I hit forty, and I thought, I guess I'm not going to parent, and I grieved that. And then a friend of mine, uh, fifteen years younger, a lesbian friend. Um, asked me if I would consider donating sperm. I said, no, I couldn't have my kid on the planet and not know them. And then she said, would you consider co-parenting? And I sobbed and said, uh, yes, yes, I would, I would consider co-parenting. We got a queer family, right? My daughter has a gay dad, a lesbian mom. She also has a sister who I love. Uh, and her sister was from a willing to be known donor because I did not want two kids, but um, Ali did. And so Maya's got a sister. And uh, her sister comes up every Christmas to me and we have this great relationship. Aww. And it's a really nice queer family that we've got that I'm so grateful for it. And after, after Maya was born, I went to a, a channeler in Toronto, a good one, real deal. And I said, tell me about this kid. And he said, oh, he tuned into her and he started to laugh. He said, oh, he said, you've been together many lifetimes. You were devotees of Christ. You were in the Egyptian era. He said, but the one that's coming through most strongly is you were spectacularly unsuccessful pirates. <laughs> I said, tell me more about that. He said, you both drowned before the ship left the dock. I'm like, okay, good to know. Yeah, I was, well, I believe that some people are meant to parent and... <laughs> You know, not, not everyone has to believe that. I'm not trying to convince anyone, but I was meant to parent and I was meant to have my girl. I just know it. Mm, and you've been that. through your own journey, right? With infertility. So yeah, my yeah. guess is you, you had parts that just knew, right? You're meant to be a mom this time yeah. around. Yeah. It just felt like if it couldn't happen, I just didn't even know what I could do. Yeah. 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 It was. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, so we had a really hard time having him. And then once we had him, it was like, oh, so we ended up having him through insemination. Um, and then, and then with, I thought, oh, okay, well now we know, we know how to do it. So we'll just have mm. to just sign up. So when he was two and I was older, so I think I was, I think so when we tried to have a second one, I think it was like 39 or something. It was just kind of like, well, you need to do it if you're going to, you know, so I was like 39. I was like, okay, well, you need to have, try to have the second one. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, dope me up on all the pills and do all the, do all the shots and all that stuff and go in and have the insemination and it didn't work. And I was like, I can't like, here we go again. So we did six inseminations oh, God. and three IVF treatments. And our IVF doctor was great. And at the end, I mean, he, he was, and it was just like, it was just such a clear no. It was just yeah. such a clear no. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I really had to work with a part of me. And I shared this. I was on Beth Rogerson's um, mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. When I started mine, I was on hers and sort of sh shared my story with her. And I shared this with her that it's like, I had to work with a part that continued to feel like infertile. And even though I had my son, mm -hmm. like I still felt like I was yeah. infertile and I didn't have any kids. And, and it ended up being this like old lady who ends, who's in a rocking chair and has her own baby. And it's not mm -hmm. my baby. It's not Eris. Mm -hmm. It's her own baby. And every once in a while, like I still, I'm, I'm you know, I'm 46 and I'm, I'm fine, but I still will count children. I'll count mm -hmm. people's children. And, mm -hmm. and there is a part of me that will say, what's wrong with me that I couldn't have or yeah. I'm not good enough that I got to have, or, you know, Oh, you get to have five kids or yeah, you, yeah. not that I would want five kids. Like, but like you get to have several and why didn't I get to have, so there's a part that says that, why didn't I get to have, like there's something I, wrong with me that I didn't get to have. So that will track back to it because I always track back to there's something wrong with me. So it's a part holding shame that that's latching on to this. Chances are, but you can, you can work with it. I want to go, I want to ask you something else. So the old woman in the rocking chair, was she a part? I always thought of her as a part. Yeah. You might want to ask, I'll tell you why. So the hairdresser I was talking about, she went through, Oh God, three IVF attempts. And, um, so I, I accompanied her through all the craziness of that, right? And, yeah. um, and at one point, <laughs> so, I'll try and give you a sense of her. She's, she's, she's fun. She's bubbly. She's really like, you know, um, connected to present day stuff, right? And uh, I said to her, well, you know, tell me what's coming up around the IVF. And she said, oh, said, oh yeah. She said, there's a part telling me I'm barren because it's God's curse. 
And I said to her, hang on, you've never shared any religious upbringing with me at all. Like, where does this come from? She said, I don't know. She said, isn't it weird? I said, it kind of is. I said, okay, bring your attention to this part. You know, what's it showing you? She said, well, it's an, it's an old woman. And it's, and it's in the fields. It's tilling the fields. And she's kind of Amish looking, right? So yeah. I said, is, is this a part? She said, I said, ask it. No. I said, okay. What does she need you to know? And this woman, she was like a, a passenger in the system, right? But she, what she needed to have witnessed was that she believed God had cursed her with barrenness and she's in the fields and she's close to death, but she, she can't move on because she's holding this um, awful feeling that God does not love her. God cursed her with being barren. So because my client was able to witness her in exactly the same way she'd witnessed a part, the old woman was able to be released from her system and actually had no connection to my client's life other than coming in through the IVF stuff, right? So just an invitation to consider that this may be a part, but it may also be a passenger. And if it is, you can just, you know, witness them and then invite them to move on. Yeah, I, I will totally do, I will do that. Um, because this part looks like she's in like Uncle Tom's cabin. It's yeah. like an old, she's old. She's got this old dress with an apron. Yeah. She's in like a cabin and it, and she's back. It's that's, sure. that's fascinating. Yeah. So now this could be a part that's presenting in that way, which is absolutely fine, but, but check. Cause if it is in fact the passenger that's not connected to your system, then you can just move her on. Uh, Tell me, because I want to wrap up, there's a couple of things I want to name. I'm very excited this year to have bought the retreat center. It's really nice to be able to offer my courses from there. Um, anyone that wants to have a look at my site, they're welcome to. Uh, there's the online course that I run. And this year in June, I'm doing a four-day intensive in Ithaca. Um, so if anyone would like to come to that, they'd be welcome to. It's going to be a, just a four-day course in really getting the, the model under your belt. And there'll be lots of practice opportunities. Uh, there's a ratio of three to one with staff that would be supervising that. So people would really have the opportunity to get to practice the model. There's a lot of people these do, days doing what they call parts work, but it's not IFS and they're not doing it from self. Mm-hmm. And they've, they've got managers that have learned about parts, but that's a whole different way of working. So I really encourage people who are interested in the model, even if they're doing parts work to consider uh, either taking one of my courses or taking the level one training if they can get in um, with the institute yeah. i love that i love that you're going to be in ithaca i'm like oh that sounds really fun Are you and close? Parts, um i don't know that i'm super, i have a friend that lives where i live and her husband's family is from ithaca and they travel there so maybe three or four hours all right yeah 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 that's the same so for me it's, it's a full, Four-hour drive for me, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm coming down with all my staff. We're calling it the road trip. I've and in my mind, it's like the Scooby-Doo mystery machine. We're going to pile in and go to Ithaca. So. Hopefully, there'll be no murders or ghosts, ghosts and murders. Right. Yeah. But yeah. You went straight to the Scooby-Doo part. I love that. <laughs> uh, the website is ifsca.ca. Yeah. And then obviously you're on YouTube at Derek Scott. Everyone go there and subscribe. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> thank you be well Tammy thank you for the thank opportunity thank you so much thank you so right, much love. thanks for hanging out today if you like this episode make sure you subscribe and if you really like this episode share it with a friend and leave a review you can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast Talk to you next time. Today's episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.